The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Michael Fox. The Venezuelan politician Leopoldo Lopez has been in the news after a judge announced last Thursday that he was guilty in a trial for his responsibility in dozens of politically motivated killings that took place during violent opposition-backed street blockades that erupted across Venezuela in early 2014. I'll speak with longtime Venezuela-based political science professor Steve Elner about Leopoldo Lopez and the Venezuelan opposition in the lead-up to this December's National Assembly elections in Venezuela. But first, we go to Mexico, where a new report is again questioning the government's line on the Ayotzinapa disappearances. Earlier this month, a team of experts from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights released their report on the forced disappearance of 43 Mexican students from the Ayotzinapa Teacher Training College last year. O sea, eso no tiene ninguna lógica desde el punto de vista de encubrimiento de un delito. Tú no acercas las pruebas a lugares donde pueden ser descubiertos. The report's findings come as no surprise to those who have been following the case and confirms what relatives of the missing students have been saying for months. The official version of events put forward by the Mexican government is a fabrication. De nada sirve construir una institución, designar personal, infraestructura, recursos económicos, si la política aquí en México, la política de Estado es desaparición, practicar la desaparición forzada. The government has long claimed that organized crime was to blame. Activists have long accused the government of covering up its role in the crime. Soy el primero en asumir el pleno interés, no solo como presidente de la República, sino porque la sociedad mexicana demanda y tiene razón en saber con verdad qué fue lo que ahí ocurrió. The report contradicts much of the government's version of events, lending greater credibility to the accusation of a cover-up. The release of the report received widespread coverage, yet outlets such as the New York Times and The Guardian avoided saying what most Mexicans were thinking that the government deliberately lied. When the news first broke last September that 43 students had been forcibly disappeared, the government said that there would be no impunity in the case and assured the public that no stone would be left unturned. This has clearly not happened. With the release of this latest report, Mexican Attorney General Arle Gomez has again promised to investigate the case. But really, the Mexican government has never intended to conduct a serious investigation. That's because, as relatives and supporters have pointed out at the rallies demanding justice, they have good reason to believe that it was the state that actually disappeared the students. Venezuelan politician Leopoldo Lopez has become the rock star of the Venezuelan opposition. Since he was imprisoned last year to stand trial for his role in the deaths of dozens during the violent street blockades, that fame has only grown. As a July article in Foreign Policy by Roberto Lovato highlighted, he has been portrayed as a combination of Mandela, Gandhi, and Simón Bolívar. Newsweek has called him, quote, a revolutionary who has it all. The New York Times gave him a platform on their op-ed page, and President Barack Obama listed him among a group of political prisoners who, quote, deserve to be free. But that image is one-sided. In reality, over the last 15 years, Lopez has had a more sordid history with Venezuelan democracy. In 2002, as mayor of the upper-class Caracas municipality of Chacao, he supported the coup against Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez and even led a protest or raid on the Cuban embassy. Last year, he was a leading figure in the violent street blockades that led to the death of 43 people in Venezuela. In the year-long trial that reached a verdict last week, Lopez was charged with inciting violence in his role as a leader of the 2014 protests. Steve Elner has been a political science professor in Venezuela at the Universidad del Oriente since 1978. He's currently visiting professor at Tulane University. Steve, thank you so much for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Good to be on the program, Michael. Steve, start us off with a little bit of the background. Who is Leopoldo Lopez and how did he become a major figure in the Venezuelan opposition? Okay, firstly, uh, Leopoldo Lopez, just to give you a little background in terms of where he's coming from, uh, 
uh, family wise. Uh, he uh, belongs to what was the Rockefeller family of Venezuela during many decades. So that's where he's coming from in terms of his family background. Um, Lopez represents, from the, very, has, from the very beginning, has represented a hard line within the opposition. And I would say, Michael, that the opposition as a whole uh, supports neoliberal policies, and that places the opposition somewhat on the right, somewhat on the right with, with a few exceptions of some leaders and some smaller parties. So they're pretty monolithic and unified in terms of their economic positions. But in terms of their position with regard to the government, uh, I would say that you uh, can talk about a hard line and a um, more moderate line within the opposition. And Lopez definitely represents the hard line. He, at first, belonged to the party Primero Justicia, which is a new party that emerged at the time that Chavez was elected president in 1998. Um, but he had a falling out and um, joined uh, another party, then eventually formed his own party, uh, Voluntad Popular, which represents the hard line within the opposition. Leopoldo Lopez has become a fairly controversial figure. Uh, there's obviously this trial for his role in the violence last year. Uh, there's also been a campaign in the United States calling for his release from prison. Conservative presidents, international presidents, have um, visited him in jail. And there's also this role he played in support of the coup in 2002 against Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. Can you talk about the more controversial aspects of Leopoldo Lopez? Well, I think that uh, to talk about the 2002 coup doesn't really differentiate um, Lopez from the other uh, opposition leaders. The opposition as a whole supported the coup, was involved in it. Uh, a number of important figures, not only political figures, but others, uh, signed the famous decree that uh, abolished the democratic institutions and practically abolished uh, the the constitution. Um, but I think that what's what's important um, uh, is his position during the protests um, last year because he definitely represented a hard line. He stated that the protests, in other words, the violence, he didn't make a distinction between the violent protests and the civil disobedience. Because, Michael, last year, there the weren't any uh, legal protests. All the protests, maybe with a few exceptions, but the protests were illegal in that the tra traffic was blocked, um, barricades were um, built in the streets, but then you had violence in, the, in terms of, uh, um, I think it was 150, 150 cases of Cuban doctors who were attacked by the protesters. You had uh, many metro stations nearly destroyed or heavily damaged in the eastern part of Caracas, which is where the, you know, which is a, where the opposition um, mayors uh, are in control, uh, and it's the middle class area of Caracas. And you had you know a lot of violence. Well, when uh, Lopez stated that these protests were going to continue until Maduro stepped down, he wasn't making a distinction between, say, legal protest, illegal protest, violent protest, nonviolent protest. He just said these protests were going to continue. And what is your analysis of the international media coverage around Leopoldo Lopez? Yeah, well, it, one thing that strikes me is that the media, both of the international media, uh, doesn't make a distinction either uh, between the, those people who are in jail as a result of committing or being accused at least of committing acts of violence and perhaps people who engage in the civil disobedience. Um, there were six nas National Guards people uh, who were killed during the, of the 43 people who were killed, six were uh, members of the National Guard and there were a couple, one or two police people who were killed as well. These distinctions aren't made uh, by the media. They just talk about uh, the victims of the protests, the, 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 the victims. They talk about violation of human rights. Uh, 
uh, but they don't make a distinction uh, between the um, protesters who were killed, and there were some who were killed, I don't have the figures, the protesters who were killed, the Chavistas who were killed, uh, and the authorities, the uh, uh, National Guardsmen and policemen, police people who were killed. Those distinctions aren't made, and the impression is left that all of this that happened was the responsibility of the government. Well, Steve, thank you so much for joining me on Imaginary Lines. It's been a pleasure. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me on the program. And now for a look at international news specifically related to the refugee crisis in Europe and also Central America. The image of the lifeless body of the Syrian toddler Alan Kurdi washed up on a shore in Turkey seemed to change the conversation around the plight of North Africa's refugees overnight. Many European governments that until that moment were demonizing the fleeing refugees began to offer their support with buses, aid, and promises of a better life. Last week, the European Union drew up a proposal to distribute migrants among its 28 members. Signs reading refugees welcome were seen across the region. This isn't about immigration. This isn't about amnesty or deportation about people here. This is about protecting our country. However, this episode has also served to expose the cynicism of media outlets or the news cycle, which has lost interest in the plight of refugees elsewhere. In June of last year, the world was shocked when it was reported that an unprecedented 50,000 unaccompanied minors from Central America had arrived at the U.S. border during the previous nine months. These minors were escaping a violent situation, not too different than that facing children in Syria. Like the present situation in Europe, refugees from Central America were demonized as invaders. Politicians of all stripes said they would work to address the root of the problem. But the message is clear. The United States is prioritizing the immediate repatriation of any person who attempts to cross our borders without proper documentation. There are no permisos, and we want people to know the facts. One year on, however, the root causes of that migration, poverty, violent crime, and a lack of opportunities for young people, remain unaddressed. Instead, the United States has simply pushed to transfer the problem from the U.S.-Mexico border to the Mexico-Guatemala border. Mexican officials stopped nearly 93,000 Central American migrants between last October and April of this year, nearly double the number from the previous period. People from Central America continue to flee by the tens of thousands, but it seems the world has stopped taking notice. The plight of those most in need cannot be fleeting or determined solely by periodic public outrage, or the image of Alan Kuri won't be the last. And that's it for today's program. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Please join me next week.